are. So welcome, welcome. As we always do, I wanna ask you to take a moment and get centered with me. All that that means is wherever you are, take a moment of conscious breath. Take a moment to take the focus, to align the focus on the breath. With so much noise and other distractions in our human world, it's so rich and amazing to be able to hone it in a little bit and just focus on the sensation of the air as it enters into our nostrils. Coming back to the awareness that we even have the capability of directing that breath into any area of our body that might need some special attention. And so we do that today. What is so wonderful about that practice is it returns us to the awareness of our power of thought and of choice, that we do have the capability of changing the direction of a single train of thought once we become aware of it. So if that train of thought is something that is depleting, we can reverse it or we can redirect it into a way that becomes more nurturing. And that reminds us of the power of, that is within us. This is a power that is inherent. It is a power that is ancient. It is something that every wisdom teacher throughout all of the ages has taught in some form or fashion. Whether it is the biblical narrative of the master teacher Jesus who said, it is done unto us as we believe, or whether it was the Buddha who said our thoughts today create the realities of our tomorrow. Any and all of these reminders are simply asking us to go back to the power of our own mind. And so today we return to that centered space with an invitation, an energy of allowing and openness that whatever we speak about, whatever we talk about today allows us the opportunity to uncover the ripe and the rich gifts that are lying in wait for us. Not something that we have to earn, but something that is consistently there, just awaiting our recognition. So we recognize those gifts today through discussion and through our time together. May it be of value for all who listen and together we say, and so it is. All right, good morning. So I have been on um, a series of themes that I've been calling Flip the Script. And Flip the Script fundamentally is to consider that nothing is as it seems. That everything that we look at and see in the physical world is a mere representation of our perceptions. That it is a mere representation of a singular dimensional experience. What has become really valuable to me about flipping the script is that as a teacher, as a teacher or a minister who is supposed to abide by a principle that says that God is all that there is, how do I bring integrity to that? I was reminded of something that was drilled into us in ministerial school, and it was that principle, that principle never wavers, not even for a special occasion. And I remember thinking, what does that mean, that principle never wavers, not even for a special occasion? So let's establish the principle is God, source, intelligence, infinite intelligence, energy, light, whatever you want to call it, that principle never wavers in terms of its allness, not even for a special occasion. Let's define that. What's a special occasion? My personal pain, my fears, my story, my history, my narrative, that what I'm being asked to consider is that any and all things, all characters, all circumstances and events, each of those things were held within this principle that that which is God has always been there and is the ultimate reality. What does that require of me? 
then? What does that require of me? Keep saying that the internet's unstable, so I'll keep coming back and repeating. What does that require of me then as the person who is wanting to live in that principle? It means that it's my responsibility then to look at any and all things in the human experience that I want to separate as God and find a way to make it God. And so some of the things that I've been, been made aware of or gifted to me through this study was uh, a couple of months ago was the first one was um, well done thy good and faithful servant. And I talked about that from the lens or the, the uh, application that most of us have heard that statement before. And it's been said at a lot of funerals and memorials of people as a sort of homage to a life well lived. And when I kept saying in my own personal study, I want to know how to bring integrity to the principle that God is all that there is, that statement came up and it said, all souls hear that. All souls hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant, from the, from the passage of one incarnation into the next. Not just the ones who have, quote, quote, earned it by the state of our measured morality, but all souls. Like, hey, you did your job. Um, another one was um, bearing false witness. And that was that any time I do not or am not willing to see God in whatever activity, that I'm bearing that person or circumstance in something called false witness. And one of those commandments is thou shalt not bear false witness. So to, to witness someone or hold someone in, an, in a story, a narrative or a label that is separate from this principle is, quote, quote, a violation of this particular principle. Like we're supposed to walk around like Jesus and see the divinity in all people, right? And so you can start to see how this kind of backs the ego into a corner because we have a lot of special occasions that we want to go, yeah, but, yeah, but. And it is in, in those things that we remain then sort of trapped in the dualism or the separation of this principle. And I don't know about you, but I've come to a stage in my life where I want to go, I want to see this principle. I don't want to just state it or talk about it or preach it or pray it. I don't want to just recite it. I want to find a way to make it meaningful. And so when I start to look and say to the, to the biggest perpetrators of my grief, well done, thy good and faithful servant. It does something. It rearranges something within my psyche that is inviting me to view things differently. When I, when I think about bearing false witness, I go, oh my God, I have, to, I have to be willing to look at this person, this circumstance in a different way. So as teaching, over these past seven weeks. And this analogy came to me and it was the David and Goliath story. And so the way we, we probably learned it was that, you know, David is the archetype of the good and Goliath is the archetype of the bad or the oppressive. And, but if you apply what I was just talking about, that nothing is as it seems, what if the Goliath then is this divine intricate gift that is there to sort of hone the practice of being able to see God in all things? And we all have our share of Goliaths. And one of the ways that we've calculated the world is to make sure that we have a really good slingshot. And the slingshot becomes the methods by which we deal with the Goliaths. 
And sometimes what happens is we lose ourselves in the relationship with the slingshot because we think that we're not equipped unless we have the slingshot. What would be an example of a slingshot? Well, I could say, you know, I could, I could say without my beads, I, I'm disconnected from God. So all of a sudden these become the slingshot and I can't go out into the world unless I have these things. But the reality is, is my relationship with the Goliath is all based in consciousness. Some people think they need this or they need that in order to be in the world or they have to gird themselves or protect themselves when it's all in mind, right? And how many Goliaths do we come up against minute by minute, day by day, if we begin to understand that not everything is it seems and that the Goliath is actually there to help, not to hinder, how would our lives be more in alignment with this principle? That's the big question. So my question to you is, or, or to open it up for any discussion, first of all, what do you feel about any of that? But secondly, um, how, how do you want to, or do you choose to want to bring integrity into the principle that God is all that there is, rather than just a statement, but to actually embody it. And I find that for me, the best way to do it is to go into the actual thing that I'm trying to avoid. It's like the, it's like the quote I always say in A Course in Miracles, love brings up everything unlike itself. So if I'm going to say I'm an advocate for love, then everything unlike it comes up in my world, not to test me, but to help me make good on my advocacy. So if I'm going to be a student of truth, or I'm, if I'm going to be someone on this particular spiritual path, how do I bring that spirituality to life? Regardless of appearance, there it is ready and solve all the problems. Let's go. Who has a comment or a thought or a question? Anybody, anybody? David, I have one. All right. As you were talking, I was looking over my morning and seeing what I held as separate from spirit or God mm -hmm. and I read that I felt I read something about President Biden was meeting with this West Virginia senator who gets half a million a year in dividends from his family's coal company and he's voting against the climate changes and the fact that a half a million dollars is keeping the country or my grandkids or the world from cleaner energy or keeping just other things. And I, as you were speaking, I was considering him like a Goliath and I felt exceptionally powerless to do anything except for what I did with it this morning is I took my attention back to um, straighten up my house, which is being shown right now to it's for sale. So I took my attention back to cleaning. The only way I knew how to not be just darn angry at that person and condemn him was just to bring it right into my own life. Mm -hmm. But what do you do? Is there anything else to do with whether it's a political figure or something that you don't have control over first approach is i'm going to put it back on you and i'm going to say historically when we think about people exactly like that people who are um, operating from self-interest from the me instead of the we this is obviously a repetitive pattern that we see throughout all of humanity in your own world and in your own life, when you have come across that, 
what have you done in the past? <laughs> well, I do remember you making me, not making me, you suggesting that I print out a, uh, a picture of Donald Trump as a baby and do Ho'oponopono prayers. I've done that. Okay. I, you know, there, there's a multitude of ways in which we can flip the script. And okay. the only reason why I'm such a big proponent of flip the script is because to me, what that does is it invites me to stretch my awareness that things are not solely locked into this singular dimensional experience. It's just, it's not Penelope living where you're living, going through this move, showing your house, doing all of these things. That, that is one thread in a cosmic blanket. It doesn't mean that the thread that you're experiencing is dismissed and, and made light of. But when you add to that thread, the multiplicity of all of the other threads in the cosmic blanket, you can go, hmm, what, what is this? What is this repeti either repetitive thing or what is the helplessness that I feel? Because if I can take the personality out of it and I can look at the helplessness because the helplessness is tied into what? It's tied into dualism and us and them. The principle is telling us that dualism is an illusion, which seems an implausible mountain to climb in the singular dimensional experience, right? Mm -hmm. Again, it doesn't mean that we turn our backs on it, but here's the thing. When we meet the dualism with dualism, when we meet the dualism with a dualistic approach of us and them, of the anger or the aggression or you name it, or tactical maneuvers or intricate ways in which we're going to plot a revenge, all that that does is perpetuate the dualism. When I or you or any individual in their self-awareness steps back for a moment and says, hmm, the best way that I can do that, do this is to cultivate a personal vision that is beyond dualism. And our best advocacy then is born from that. That kind of advocacy is the one that says, even in the appearance of this dualism, there is, there is a symbiosis, there's an organism, there is a God. And you can even say, and I demand to see it. You can make a demandment on the energy and say, I demand to see it rather than falling to the helplessness. And what's so beautiful about making a demandment upon the principle is the principle in and of itself is, is not, it's, it's, it's an, you know, a neutral thing. Imagination is a neutral thing. Imagination just sits there in wait for its use. So if I want to use the field of imagination to work against me, to fuel my helplessness, so be it. If I want to use my field of imaginations to help me fuel my, um, my non-dual advocacy, so be it. But it's waiting on you to make a demandment of it. So in a way, when you feel helpless, you're still making a demandment of the use of that energy. And you're making a demandment that it continue to contain you in a sense of helplessness. And what's so wonderful Penelope, is that that will never be a right or wrong, good or bad choice. It's the, it's the way in which we approach the, the infinite nature within the drop of the ocean. So I can just see the drop as, as a drop separate, or I can see the drop as the entirety of the ocean. And that's what I am. 
And so I want to make a demandment on the principal. That's kind of what it is. I'm making a demand on the principal to help make me be in integrity with it. And every time I do that, I get a little tool. I get a little insight. I can see, David, as I, as I listen to you, that the gift I got out, I may not be able to do anything about this, but the gift I got out of that bit of news and reacting to it was I, it moved me out of practicing the presence of God. It moved me out of my peace or my love or my acceptance or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I hated how it felt inside of me, even though nobody else in the world was influenced by how I felt. So I could look at the gift, listen to this word of this, holy jerk um, <laughs> as being okay he reminded me to practice the presence of the one yeah. and is isn't that what a goliath is isn't and and you've been around me long enough to know when i teach about worry that i i try to take the stigma off of us worrying and i say what if worry is a signal and not a trigger Therefore, what if everything that we see is working for us? Because exactly right. that, if he's holding this up, isn't, isn't in the words of Ernest Holmes, all of the world is a mirror reflecting back to us the innermost workings of our own internal consciousness? Right. And so right. all that it is, is that, again, it's not about rolling over and taking it. It doesn't mean that if you were really, if you were really involved in the advocacy for, for clean energy, that you would take that information and then just discard it. It means that whatever is your route of advocacy, the best thing that you can do is all of the work that we just discussed first. Mm -hmm. That you align yourself, whatever that means to you, with that principle, whatever that principle means to you, and then go advocate. Do you see the difference? Yes. Because now you're not marching in like this. Now you're marching in with vision. Now you're approaching a systemic issue with a solution rather than someone who's just regurgitating the systemic issue. And that's what the world needs. You know, Howard Thurman says, what the world needs is for people to come alive, yeah. to come alive with their vision. Who else? Anybody? Um, I'll jump in for a second. Hey, Donna. Um, hi, love. Um, you know, this just is a reminder for me to deepen my trust in the unfolding of things. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I don't know. And so um, to stop pushing against, you know, as Penelope, Penelope was saying about the, the trigger, instead of me fighting against something or pushing against something to stay curious mm -hmm. in the unfolding of it is, it's, is perhaps just a stepping stone in the entirety. So, um, to keep trusting the unfolding. My, my sign back there on the wall says it all unfolds. It, it's such a mantra for me to remember. It's unfolding constantly, constantly. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. And I just have to stay curious. But I really love this process um, of accepting, you know, and bringing it more internal than external. That, that is what I'm yeah. really receiving from the, the conversation. It's, it's like always um, leaving space for the and. Mm, yes. Leaving space for the comma and not the period. And, and that, how beautiful is that? The, the, ever, the ever unfolding nature, the eternality of that unfolding. And, and I think sometimes the helplessness is when we can subconsciously, when we subconsciously have put in a period where a comma could be. And, and the comma is also sort of subjective, like the comma for Ray or for Lori, what might be different from the comma from Penelope in regards to the stages of the experience of, of 
this human life that we're having. But um, it's, it's wonderful to be in that unfolding. I had a teacher once early on say, you know, always be careful about how you lock someone into an identity. Because some, some, some people are, and this is the analogy, some people are sitting home wondering what to do. Some people are sitting home in their wonderment going, I think I'll go to a movie. Some people are now opening the paper to try to figure out what movie they want to go see. Remember in the days when the movies were in the newspaper? <laughs> Some people have already made a decision and are in the car to go to the theater. Some people are already at the theater standing in line to buy the movie ticket. Some people have already bought the ticket, already gone through concessions and are sitting in one of the theaters having the experience. Some people have finished the movie and are walking out. And he went on and on and on in this sort of micro description of all of these different phases. And he says, it doesn't matter what phase you're in, everyone's a part of the same unfoldment. And so no matter who it is that we're watching or who it is that we're seeing, um, we, we can never fully depict or describe what level of their unfoldment is. But here's the beautiful thing. If more and more people hold another in their perception, in their unfoldment, rather than in their demise or in an identity that has a period in it, by that meaning, if I'm praying for someone, if I'm putting a picture, we always talk about how Ram Das used to put the people who he was troubled by a picture of them on his puja, his altar next to God and you know all the all the Hindu saints and he would say hello Shiva hello whoever and and it was a way for him to envelop them and bring them into that particular atmosphere so if we did that energetically let's say it's like you said Donna we're we're seeing them in their unfoldment rather than a locked concretized identity that in and of itself is another great and what if in flipping the script, we realize all along that we are our brother and sister's keeper. And the way that we're our brother and sister's keeper is by that exercise. That when you're flipping the script, you realize that our perception is what has dictated our experience of that person. But if I, if I, deliberately demand to see the God in all of that, my experience then with that person becomes what it is that I'm demanding. And so now I want to demand consciously. I like to think that it's kind of what Ram Das was doing when, when he would look at these political figures on his puja, the most sacred altar in his space, and he would see them there was an invitation in that energy to see them differently. That's personal work. We're always wanting the thing in the external to change, but it's like every single time, it's like bringing us back, it's going, no, that's on you. The perception then becomes the highest uh, class in the curriculum of being human. It's my perception. Anybody else? Thoughts? Hey, this, conversation, this conversation is rather enlightening and, and a good reminder for me in terms of when I'm in my work environment to look at the people that, that stir things within me that are not necessarily positive or what I would label as positive to recognize that they're on their own individual journey and they're doing the best they can, even though their best is not in alignment with mine. And therefore I should hold space in some way, shape or form of, you know, that, that their best is what they're capable of and to be kind and to find kindness. And, and as you were saying, you know, hold them up in a, in a way. And mm -hmm. it's, it's always challenging 
but it's always a positive reminder. I have a, I have a, a, a post-it note that says, you don't know what they're experiencing, you know, mm -hmm. the four agreements, uh, you know, what somebody else is saying has no bearing on, on me. And, and, you know, and, and reminders of those that to me, that's the Goliath part of it. When you were talking, mm -hmm. it really feels like, I don't know what they're experiencing. I don't know what's troubling them. That's making them act the, the way they are in that particular experience. And as long as I hold space and, and recognize that they're doing the best they can, I show up in those encounters as my best self. Mm -hmm. And, and we've, we've shared that kind of narrative a lot. I know in, in the, in the spiritual communities about people doing, I, I want to add something to that. Okay. And when we talk about flipping the script and it's like, here, here's Lori, here's me, here's anyone. And I I've said this so many times, like, oh, they're doing the best that they can. The more that I get granular with that, the more that I go, is that coming from my ego? Meaning, do I think that I'm here and they're here? And so I'm looking down and going, oh, they're doing the best that they can. And what I've started to consider is, oh my God, David, what if you've got this all wrong? Flip the script. What if they're here and you're here? And they're exhibiting this kind of behavior in order to raise you up to become here. Meaning it's, it's the same thing like I was sharing with Penelope that if I want to practice, if I want to become curious in flipping the script and I, so I, I get in my car, I'm on my way to work. I'm going to do what I'm going to teach. I'm going to travel, whatever it is. And I'm going to say, Today, in the next hour, I'm going to practice flipping the script. Nothing is as it seems. Everyone is my teacher and I am the student. Then the teacher sometimes will exhibit this kind of behavior in order to do what for the student? To get them to become more aware of a particular ideology about separation. You know, I'll tell you one of the biggest ones was over the years, as I think about my time overseas and doing the work for my foundation, there were many, many years in the beginning where without even being aware of it, here's David, David is helping this. And then it became so embarrassing when I realized what I was doing because it's kind of like savior complex. Oh, let me help those less fortunate. And the more that I started to work in consciousness with the idea that nothing is as it seems, I thought, wouldn't that be a paradigm shift if all along they've been the master teachers trying to teach me how to be able to see things through a different lens and a different perception? What if all along, and this became a reality in doing different deeper level work is that in the beginning when all of that happened and I was quote, quote, feeding children, what I saw in the whole flipping the script narrative is that the children were feeding me. And so moving forward in my life, every time that I find myself going my spiritual path is better than this spiritual path, or my choices are better than these choices. You know, I start to see that sort of very insidious ego that is still locking in a form of duality. And so every time that I keep committing, make, 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 Allow me, show me, bring me to a place of greater integrity with the principle that God is all that there is. And what ends up happening is um, I'm continually sh being shown where my ego has been in charge, whether it's by fear or domestication or any number of things. You want, you want to know a powerful question? Ask the principal, say, show me what I have become. 
Show me the cumulative effect of all of the false thought or the forgetfulness that I have created an identity around. That's fun. <laughs> that one's fun. But, you know, it's, it's beautiful and sacred work. And if not now, when? If not now, when? And isn't it amazing when you start to think then that to live the principle means that we get to do that in all the incarnations. And so for this one, why not try to maximize it with the amount of time that we have left on the planet? Who knows? What would it be like if I dropped my story? What would it be like if I willingly opened my heart and did this type of of um, spiritual meditative work in, in my own consciousness? What if I took the rest of the day and as I went out into the world, I practiced looking at the Goliaths as my angels? It's remarkable stuff. It makes the whole path of forgiveness something far greater, less dutiful and something more fascinating. Time for one more question. Anybody? I've really appreciated um, the remembrance of, of being the witness and as opposed to maybe a personality, I'm looking at, you know, a, a particular <laughs> situation I was in yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I really was able to step back and look at um, why am I being defensive or why am I trying to distract myself with some other activity? And, but just remembering to be the witness of mm. what, what it was that was going on and what prompted me to react this way. It's really a vulnerability to be able to open yourself up to looking at this because it's not easy. <laughs> yeah, and it, it, that vulnerability, I think is precious coin. You know, when I think about spiritual coin, I think that anything that lends itself to being vulnerable is, is the most rich, fertile practice that we can engage in. Because that in and of itself is the dissolving of all the protection that we've built in. Can you imagine how much protection we have around us that we don't even know, that we've accumulated and, and fostered and, and um, built just, just to live and to be vulnerable purposefully means that I'm willing to shed some of that. One I'm a control time. freak, so not easy. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all have a little bit of that in this. Yeah. One, one more question. Anybody? Did you find this helpful, valuable? Cool. Yeah. I love it when we can have questions like this. All right, my friends, thank you so much for a part of your Sunday time. And um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to edit and put the little tag ends on this and this will post and this will be the Sunday talk. That means that you are on the platform of the church. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. Much love. Have a great day. Bye. Go love those Goliaths. <laughs>